But first is Friday, and here to discuss a busy news week, we welcome Claire Heddles, Enterprise Reporter at Jacksonville Today. Hello, Claire. Hi, AG. Um, Tim Gibbons of the Jacksonville Business Journal. Good to be here. Thanks, Tim. Dave Barreline of Florida Times Union in studio. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> and uh, rounding out the foursome, blogger and regular mm-hmm. contributor, Fred Matthews. Fred, how are you doing? Good morning, AG. I'm doing fine. Great, Fred. Well, let's talk about this week. We'll go to your calls in a moment, 904-549-2937. You can also email us at firstcoastconnect at wjct.org, connect on our Facebook page, or tweet at wjct.news. We're going to begin with our top story. Um, Jacksonville Today reporter Claire Heddles outlined how some of the laws, new laws will affect Northeast Florida. Let's start with the big one, the new abortion law. Uh, Claire, go ahead and tell us about that law. Right. So this is Florida's 15 week abortion ban. This was going into effect with almost 150 other new laws today. And we saw these hearings this week and in really a late hour decision yesterday afternoon, a Leon County judge ruled that the law violates Florida, Florida's privacy clause, Florida Constitution privacy clause, and will file an injunction. So he gave this verbal ruling, but said that it won't take effect until he can file it, which won't be until Tuesday. So technically that law is in effect for three or four days, but he, he is planning to file this injunction on Tuesday, repealing the law. Yeah, and you know, regarding the, the gap between filing the injunction and the inevitable appeal from the governor's office, I mean, does that mean the procedure is already illegal, basically? I mean, how long will it be between those two filings? Right. So, I mean, I guess I should clarify not repealing the law, blocking the law, yeah. probably temporarily, because the state will definitely appeal. And based on what the judge was saying yesterday, you know, really, he felt like the state did not provide very good experts, very good argument, but the state could absolutely change that in the appellate court. And with another judge, it could go into effect within the next few weeks again. So I think many abortion activists felt like this was a win, especially after Roe v. Wade last week. But it's it's not necessarily a long term win, and and his ruling could be overturned. Yeah, I mean, in, uh, in the coming weeks, that's very likely. I mean, Dave, through the Sands administration, we've seen time and time again um, these new laws. Um, they get preliminary um, stricken down, and then they're upheld. Um, that looks like the trajectory here. How is it? Why is it working this way? And how is the Sands administration able to basically overturn judicial precedent and legal precedent? Well, it remains to be seen if they do. Um, Obviously, the issue here is that there was this prior Supreme Court ruling, Florida Supreme Court ruling, that this uh, privacy provision in the Constitution uh, protects abortion access in Florida. And so that was what this particular uh, ruling was hung on. So uh, we've seen this before, where a district judge in Tallahassee uh, rules against the DeSantis administration, Then it goes to the appeals court who does rule in favor of the DeSantis administration. Now, this time, you know, what does the appeals court do? Do they make their own precedent and overturn a previous Florida Supreme Court ruling? Or is this something that's going to go all the way to the state Supreme Court? Look, it's a different state Supreme Court now than it was. This is a court that's full of DeSantis appointees. So it's uh, different judges, different justices, and could very well be a different ruling. Yeah. Uh, and Tim, I want to get you in on this, too. Um, you know, when when you look at this particular law, uh, the 15 week abortion ban, I mean, we obviously had legislation on the local level um, trying to protect the right of city employees to circumvent that ban. Um, how does this play into the culture war here in Jacksonville, um, this this abortion um, decision and this change in the law? And what does the future look like in our city? <laughs> we knew what the future would look like. Um, I, I think that's that's the big question where cultural issues have, you know, swallowed pretty much all of politics. And um, you, you saw the the protests in the streets after the Roe v. Wade decision. Um, obviously, there are local activists on both sides of this issue who um, are continuing the fight. And like like everything else in politics, now it becomes the motivating thing of does this get people to the polls? Does this become the thing that takes over elections? Yeah, I mean, that that's a big question with this. And we're, we're taking your calls here, 904-549-2937. It's a holiday weekend, so there's there's room in the queue. Um, I want to move on with some of these other laws. Um, Fred, I want to get you in here on the Stop Woke Act um, yeah. that Governor DeSantis, uh, 
He, he calls the bill that. Um, it bans ways of teaching about race and racism in schools and workplaces. Um, Fred, what do you think drove the governor to, to push this kind of legislation? The base. Um, the base of the Republican Party here in Florida, those who will vote for Republicans and anybody uh, with the red shirt, no matter what. And there is a feeling as you travel around Florida, especially in certain areas of Florida, that uh, that they are quite frankly offended by the number of, of, of people who are, um, are, are not heterosexual, that are moving up in government, that are um, that are involved in politics in a deep way, and and quite frankly, people a number of people are offended by that, and that have those people that are offended by that largely are members of the Republican Party, part of his base, and it certainly doesn't hurt uh, for him to to move with that because and and by stealing the word woke, he's stealing it from <laughs> from young rappers because that's where it came from the, the the rap movement he's stealing that from them from their end of it to 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 make this to make this work it's just an appeal to the base that's all that's all it is that's all the governor has been doing for the last year and a half to shore up his conservative cred credentials um when we you know again we get the government we, we voted for yeah i mean that's that's very true and um, we do have a version of democracy in the state uh, five four nine two nine three seven for calls. Um, Claire, I want to get you in here. Uh, Fred made a really in interesting point about inverting the uh, previously positive adjective "woke" to mean something negative and sinister. Is, is that the culture war play that Republicans make here? I mean, why did they use this terminology, and how did this bill come to be? Right. I mean, I think with a lot of the laws that we're seeing taking effect, we saw Democrats criticize the Republican supermajority for focusing on these issues that appeal to De DeSantis's base, these issues that he was heavily advocating for rather than things like affordable housing or other issues that are Im impacting people's daily lives. And so for him to name it Stop Woke is really, I think, a, a signal to his base as to what his motivations were. The language of the law, you know, is can be really broadly interpreted and in what the plaintiffs who are suing over it and tried to block it this week and a judge, you know, rejected their their request for an injunction. Um, <clears throat> what they're saying is that this will really have a chilling effect because it's it's not really specific about what you can teach. And so it will likely lead teachers and workplaces to cut back on discussions about race. Yeah. Which I think was the goal of, of DeSantis. Yeah, I mean, and and I want to get this this corollary issue in here also this this book challenging thing that's happening. I mean, we're seeing this in school boards, and and Dave, I want to get you in on this. I mean, you're you're a parent, obviously. Uh, you don't have any intention of challenging any books, clearly. But what what are people doing to challenge books, and what kind of books are being called out for pro potentially problematic content? You know, it often deals with sexuality. I think that's uh, some of the books that have been banned. But, you know, there's also been moves to ban books that talk about race. And uh, I, th I think it is a effort to kind of control what kind of uh, art, let's face it, or books uh, young people are exposed to at schools. And it highlights this idea that uh, this sort of fear factor that when children are outside of the home, that parents have lost control of what kind of uh, cultural exposure they have to different ideas, different thoughts, different viewpoints. And that does resonate in some part with parents who feel like, uh, you know, there's the, we do live in a, a culture that's got a lot going on in terms of online, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's part of it. But it's also just this idea that, uh, you know, that they are out there trying to indoctrinate your children and you should be very afraid of that. And that does resonate with a certain amount of people. Yeah. Um, got a couple more here. Obviously got 150 of them. Um, Fred, I, I want to get you in on this uh, active shooter drill. Schools are going to be required to hold emergency and active shooter drills at least once a year. Um, you know, can you talk a little bit about, about this and what it says about the evolving mindset of schools? I mean, obviously we were in school decades ago. It was a little bit different then. Um, yeah, so what's the mindset between behind these active shooter drills? 
Well, the mindset behind them is is fairly obvious and clear. It is to get everyone prepared for what today seems to be inevitable activities in random, what could be inevitable in your school. Nobody knows when or where. Um, it's uh, it's taking the place of the fire drill. <laughs> Quite frankly, it could take the place of the old fire drill. Or if we go back to the early 60s, it could take the place of ducking under your desk in preparation for the next nuclear strike. The Civil Defense uh, the Civil drills. Defense Act, remember that? I mean, well, I know you don't remember it, but I, I, some of us do. Ducking under the desk and actually actually preparing for that nuclear strike. This is the new normal now that is happening, and this is a preparation for it, for for uh, for our uh, getting our kids and the teachers prepared for what could happen at any time. It's unfortunate, but these are the times we live in. I don't think anybody can really oppose this uh, because we just don't know when or where. So um, it's probably a, a decent thing for the legislature to have done. We'll see how it plays out. We'll see if it does take the place of the fire drill. Yeah, and it's interesting. I mean, we, we've seen this evolution in our lifetimes, Fred, from um, being worried about external enemies, this country, um, to the enemy within. And um, we're seeing that as a subtext of a lot of this legislation that, that came through also, the Stop Woke Act particularly. I got one more. I want to get you in here on this, Tim. Um, local governments are going to be able to ban the smoking of filtered cigarettes on, on beaches. Fernandina Beach is going to do this. Um, you know, what's what's the logic here? Why why can't I smoke my Winston Light on the beach? Well, and, and you can still smoke unfiltered cigars, which is the um, the, the idea is that the filters themselves um, are, are litter that the beach goers don't want. Um, just real quick, I'm going to circle back to the, the Stop Work Act because right. a lot of the attention is focused on the educational system. There's actually a big concern for businesses because it um, many of us have gone through various um, sensitivity training and things that um, you know, the DEI space is huge in American corporations now. And there is a real fear that all of that mandated HR training sort of thing suddenly is going to open up companies to lawsuits. So um, one of the things I find ironic from a, a pro-business state is many of the um, things the legislator take, legislature takes up is designed to insulate businesses from lawsuits. This opens up a whole new can of worms that companies actually are concerned about. Yeah, and, and we saw that with the Santa's vetoing the uh, bill that uh, banned local governments from imposing um, onerous uh, ordinances on local Shockingly. businesses. Shockingly. Yeah, I mean, that yeah, the, the, the ban on that, the, the, not ban, the, the veto on that was uh, is not something people expected. The, that bill would have opened up um, governments to, to a range of lawsuits from companies. Um, obviously had, had business backing on that, but uh, various government agencies were very, very opposed. Yeah, and that was a priority of, of local Travis right. Hudson of St. John's County. Um, so yeah, a lot of bills went into effect today. There's um, about 150 others. Um, we could uh, go into them further. We're, we're not going to. We've got a busy agenda. 549-2937 for your calls. And I want to stay with Tim here um, because we're talking about a new train that could be happening. Um, Commuter rail from Jackson St. Augustine could happen before the close of the 2020s, according to Jacksonville Business Journal. Um, it would take hundreds of millions of dollars from the federal government to make this happen. The JTA, Jacksonville Tra Transportation Authority, says that it, it could happen anyway. Uh, Director of Economic Development Richard Clark told the St. Augustine City Commission there could be service between Jacksonville and St. Augustine in three to five years. The most difficult parts, getting the local governments aligned and getting the north with $600 million needed. No big deal, right? But in a perfect world, Clark says, you could have an operating train in three years. Laying track is a less than 12-month process. Um, he cites commuter traffic. Um, I-95 is a mess. Um, Tim, um, we, we've been here before. We've been on the show together for over a decade. I, I think we were on the same panel where somebody discussed moving to, having the Skyway run to Nocatee. So uh, people have some great ideas about this. Is this more feasible? I Here's the thing, I, and, and I, I, as you know, um, b both of us try not to let cynicism ever enter the, uh, the no. conversation, but, <laughs> but it, it's hard to look at light rail and say it's something that um, 
voters on the first coast would support that state government, which is not a fan of mass transit, would support. Um, you look at the issues that the Bright Line has in Central Florida, but the Bright Line is is underway, and and you know there there is um, you know they, they have trains running, and they're they're looking to expand it. So um, there are obviously are people across Florida who have gotten transit projects like this done. What I think JTA is saying, and it is an interesting point, that the actual infrastructure building is not the biggest deal. The right of way is there, the the um, ability to lay track, that's pretty easy. I, I mean, I find estimations of a year, um, God knows how many projects we cover that that timeline ends up stretching, but it really is a political will and a money issue. And the economic impact could be huge. I mean, you think of all of the workforce needs, you think of all the people who are traveling back and forth from St. John's County to, to downtown, having another way of doing that without building more highway lanes could have a huge impact. Okay, um, thanks, Tim. Um, we're going we're gonna to take a call here. Uh, we got Greg Burton on line one. Um, Greg Burton, um, school space, safety specialist. He wants to weigh in on active shooter drills. Um, go ahead, Greg. Good morning. Thank you for taking my call. And I'm also the chief of school police at Duval County. I just wanted to give more clarity on the active shooter drills. We've been doing these drills since 2018 with the uh, introduction of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Act. We also, faith schools, we not only do active shooter drills, we're required to do um, one a month and two in the month of August. And then we also do emergency drills, which include fire drills. So you end up doing two drills a month, one for active shooter, and then one for uh, either hurricanes, um, other drills, or, or fire drills. And also the Office of Safe Schools um, takes into consideration the fact that these drills are sometimes uh, traumatized they sometimes tra traumatize young kids. And so we're taking active, um, we're being active in ensuring that we have less of an impact on the um, mental trauma side of what these drills could cause. So there's a lot of um, resources being built into that. Some of these we may do um, tabletop drills, not all would be um, active uh, drills that um, people are actually physically going into. So the Office of Safe Schools is looking into this, and for the parents out there who, who um, are concerned about very young children being affected, we are looking at that and making steps to, to make sure that your children are uh, less traumatized. Uh, Greg, I've got a comment here from another listener named Tom McGuire. Um, I wanted to get your take on this. Active shooter drills are just a signal of our failure to prevent weapons getting to the hands of those who would harm them. These drills cannot help but be traumatizing to our children. Um, Greg, I'm going to ask you, is the problem here guns? Uh, you've got a wife well, who's running for sheriff, so I mean this is a salient question politically. So I, I can't speak to the fact whether it's it's guns or not. Um, I would I wouldn't touch that because that's a very um, controversial issue. My job is to ensure that if guns are involved, to ensure that we take all um, actions to prevent the guns from coming in, and we're doing that by a number of means. The um, we live in a gun culture. And well, is that a positive a, thing? I mean, you know, we, we, we're in a country that has the most mass murders of any in the world. And we call it a gun culture. Is that positive? Um, I, I'm not going to say it's positive or negative, but that's the culture we live in. Like, as Fred said, these are the times that we live in. And because these are the times that we live in, we can't on an individual basis in our school system change that. But what we can do is address the possibility of, because we are in a gun culture society, address the everything we can 
to ensure that our children are safe. I get that, but I want to push back a little bit because, I mean, we've been discussing, I mean, clearly the state believes it has a compelling interest in anti-woke education, education about um, gender, about race, um, and all these issues is very prescriptive. And we see it with, like, Government Institute of Civics training, but on gun culture we're suddenly agnostic? I mean, that, that seems like a cop-out. Well, uh, it's not a cop out. It's the world that I live in, in the world of safety. And my job is to ensure that the children are safe. And we do this by many means, either by hardening the school, by addressing mental health, um, by ensuring that schools um, that children are not bringing or young people are not bringing guns to school. And this, this is the society that we live in. And it's been created over years and years and years. But we are here, and because we are here, um, we simply have to do our part, not just in the school district, but the parents as well. Yeah, and and speaking of that, does the next sheriff need to do something about guns on the street? I mean, do we need to do more aggressive um, gun confiscations or, you know, just— I'll I'll leave that to the candidates for sheriff. Okay, understood. All right, thank you, Greg. I appreciate your call. Uh, we're going to move on. Appreciate it. Um, so I, w- I want to get you back in here on the train thing, Claire. <laughs> um, <laughs> moving on. Um, with, with this train, would you take it to St. Augustine? I mean, you're, you're relatively new to the area. I mean, is it something that would appeal to you? I mean, maybe I might take it to the beach. I think when you opened this segment, you know, you said train in vain question, which I think is a great point. Is that skepticism? Because really they're thinking about it for these commuters that are coming from St. John's. There's more commuters coming from St. John's and to Duval than the, the other way, of course. But Jacksonville is such a sprawling city. I think many of those commuters aren't going to downtown. We have all of these parking garages. What will happen with those in downtown? It's, I, I just have a hard time imagining the demand for a workday commute from St. John's County to Jacksonville. Yeah, I, I mean, see, for I, everyday I, residents, I want to go to the beach. That sounds great. But for a $600 million project, it's hard to imagine the ban- demand is there. Yeah, this sounds like uh, sounds like Richard Clark uh, dream weaving a little bit. Um, Dave, I, I want to get you in on this. I mean, St. John's County, it's a car culture. Um, you know, they, their solution to almost anything is to expand a road. Um, would people be really trainable to take this commuting option, <laughs> given the fact that when they get to Jacksonville, um, there's really not reliable ground transportation in a way commensurate with other big cities? Yeah, trainable. That's a good way of putting it, A.G. I, you know, I, <laughs> no pun intended. I, I think I've seen uh, over the years all sorts of different studies that have been floated on this. Now, I don't think the demand is there. I think it would be running empty trains with empty seats. You know, I was driving around town the other day at rush hour, and they built these uh, express lanes where people can you know, pay a toll to be able to get there faster. Very few people that I saw in those toll lanes. So if you're not having people using toll lanes to get from point A to point B faster, why are they going to get in a train in order to, quote, beat traffic that, you know, they, they're they not getting into toll lanes right now that I've seen in great numbers. So I just don't see it really happening. It's probably fine to plan for it. But the idea that by 2030, you know, there's going to be a train running between Jacksonville and St. Augustine for commuters. I just don't see it. Yeah, and there's also the right-of-way issues. I mean, this is developed land. So right. to get these kind of easements and everything, you're going to pay top dollar to whoever owns this land. Um, you know, that, that creates another issue I don't think Mr. Clark is mentioning. Right. I mean, you know, even right now, do, do people ride the buses in great numbers in Jacksonville? I mean, uh, I just don't see it as being transit and— uh, you know, are there really that many people from St. Augustine go to Jacksonville, you know, maybe from northern St. John's County for work, but St. Augustine's its own little sort of ecosystem down there in terms of where people work and live. And are people in Nocatee going to drive to a, a train station and then chop on a commuter train to go downtown, which isn't as big of an employment hub as it used to be? It just feels a little bit of a wishful thinking going on here. Yeah, and, and that's that's a very interesting point. Um, I, I think that's where we're at. We'll wait and see how this develops, obviously, but, uh, you know, they, they've got to show and prove, I guess, is what we're saying. Um, speaking of showing and proving, uh, we've got Corrine Brown. She's running for office again. Uh, can Corrine deliver? Um, 
Politico Playbook has covered the story this week. Uh, Brown has jumped into the race for Florida's 10th congressional district. That's the Orlando area, as we know. But there are unresolved issues with her qualification for the ballot. Go figure. Uh, Brown was in Congress until 2016. She was defeated by Al Lawson in the primary, as we know, after her district was reconfigured, then convicted in the one door for education charity fraud case. The commission was thrown out, but then she pleaded out on one count um, before there was a new trial. She owes $62,000 in restitution. Um, She was dropped from Florida's voter rolls, um, and she registered to vote again in Duval County in November 2021. Also, she signed a candidate oath on June 14th of this year that said that she'd been a registered member of the Democratic Party for 365 days before qualifying, which would supersede that oath. Um, The State Department is saying that they basically accept the oath as provided to their office. They don't confirm or deny. Uh, Brown's campaign manager, Corey Bradford, who is local, has not responded to Politico's questions um, on this. Florida's voting laws concerning people with felony convictions requires that these people must pay off all fees, fines, and restitutions before they can vote. Is Brown an eligible candidate? That's an open question. Um, Fred, um, I want to get you in here on this. Um, Corey Brown's political comeback, how do you think it's going? Well, if you listen to Corrine Brown, it's going well. <laughs> Now, you know, that those are all of the uh, questions, that, you know, that most voters and, and folks who are just observing this story uh, were all, would be all puzzled about, paying the fines back that would be there. Certainly she got a great deal and accepted a great deal that gets her all out of the judicial system per se. But it just still goes to the core question of how can a convicted felon be running for office? And, of course, those of us in the, in the know know that she's a federally a uh, convicted felon, and, and she's running for a federal office, and that does not, uh, the federal laws do not prevent her from running for that office. Now, the key here is that realize that, you know, Corrine is not doing this by herself. Uh, I've had a couple of conversations with her uh, over the last uh, week or so, and basically her and her daughter Chantrell are the ones trying to work through these machinations to get this done uh, so they can, you know, get her on the ballot in time. And I mean, she's registered, but, but get through all of this and make sure she's on the ballot to run in this district where she, where there are a, a lot of democratic candidates already in there running. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see in the end, if she makes the ballot, but I haven't seen any ads, no political activity that's going on yet that says that this can this candidacy is actually for real. But again, in talking with Corrine and those, it's real for her. She's bound and determined to do it. And, um, you know, if they can work through these last, all the things you talked about to get to make sure she's on the ballot, she'll be there. But her winning is going to be a whole entirely different thing. Yeah, I want to get you in here, this Claire. Um, you know, because Corrine Brown is kind of a new commodity to you. Um You know, but she's got some hurdles here. I mean, she's running in Orlando. She served Orlando for parts of her congressional career, obviously. Um, In her statement of filing for candidacy, she said her heart has always been with the people of Orlando. Um, That's that's a claim that may or may not be true. But as a voter, if you saw a Jacksonville candidate come into an Orlando primary with Jacksonville campaign managers and this and that, would you be inclined to support that candidate? Or would you, as an Orlando voter say, maybe not go with somebody who's spent the last four, few years dealing with felony charges? I mean, I will say, if nothing else, she does have the name recognition probably across the state, not just in Jacksonville, even if it is notoriety from the felony charges. So I think, you know, she probably will have some of that name recognition to voters in Orlando. The The question of her candidacy, I think, you know, based on federal law, it's clear that she can run this question of whether or not she was registered to vote in time. As far as I can tell from the state law, it seems to require that you're not registered with any other party within the last year, but not necessarily that she had to have been registered with the Democratic Party for the full year. So I think legally it seems like she is a qualified candidate, can run, absolutely. It's these questions that really will come down to voters, whether or not they see these as as suspect and I think that's hard to say. I mean, she did do some good things, but of course, that's been overshadowed in recent years over these felony convictions. 
Yeah, and, and and Dave, and this is an interesting interesting point here. I mean, one of the opponents she has in this race is Natalie Jackson. I mean, we we covered the Corrine Brown trial, the first one, and Natalie Jackson was briefly a defense attorney for Corrine Brown. Um, could that come into play in this race, or or no? Uh, it's coming I into mean, play right now, AG. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's kind of unusual yeah, to run possibly, against your old defense yeah, that's, attorney. Oh, boy, I didn't realize that. What a small world. Okay. Um, yeah, it could. I mean, uh, the the deal there is they have so many people running that you just need a plurality. Uh, you don't have to get 50%. You just have to get the most votes of the bunch. So this pile gets sliced a lot of different ways. Maybe Corinne Brown has some hardcore base that puts her over the top. My sense of it is that she's uh, she hasn't been there in several years. Yes, she did some good things in Orlando in that area, but, you know, memories fade. And uh, I just know my sense when I saw her in doing some of her interviews, uh, in some ways she seems like uh, a different person. I mean, she's older. That's going to be a real grueling campaign. If she's not up already doing a lot of barnstorming, it's just hard to see her coming into – a district that is not in her hometown and pulling it off through some sympathy uh, tour of uh, I'm back type of uh, approval of her getting back in the ring. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the thing about it. And, um, you know, when, when you look at the situation like Corinne Brown, it, it seems like she is diminished um, from the trial time. And we, we saw her in the trial and she basically did a one woman defense. It was like performance art as her as her defense and it was an amazing performance that didn't do her any good legally but i don't think she could pull that off today and you know in a race with younger candidates with candidates that have more local connections more local motivation we we have to ask is if there's any there there with this campaign i i think that's the question got another comment from um a listener once again corinne brown bends and breaks the rules her long history of doing this is well known. I think that is why she is seeking office in Orlando, where her various scandals may be less well known. Um, we will see. We will follow this race, obviously, from afar. Uh, 549 for calls. Uh, this has not been a banner day for calls, but if you want to get in, you still have time. Um, we have um, another story here to get to. Um, silence is golden for Jacksonville City Council. Cheering foot stomping, sign waving, out of bounds for the public at Jacksonville City Council meetings under new rules approved this week. The council voted up a bill 14 to 4 defining and banning disruptive behavior at meetings, including making shows of support for political candidates, using threatening language, making offensive gestures, ignoring time limits on speaking, the, the cruelest cut of all, or making any other display of excessive noise, sounds, or movements. This bill was introduced in March by Council President Sam Newby, who's no longer Council President, uh, saying it was necessary to define disruptive behavior. Um, so, so Dave, I want to get you in here. Um, this is part of a long trend of sort of clipping the wings of commenters, right? Yeah, it, it's obviously they have 90 minutes for people to talk about everything under the sun. And uh, so that does happen to some extent in those uh, those meetings. But, you know, the real disruptive stuff is when you have really hot button issues and people show up in groups and they uh, they respond to some of the comments and it can get a little bit unruly. It seems like it's almost a rite of passage now. Every council president has to close the chambers and throw everybody out in order to show that they're they're tough at running the meetings it's, uh, you know, it's going to be open to interpretation. Um, you know, wh some of the, uh, you know, making gestures. I mean, how does that get enforced? But, uh, you know, to the extent that it's a collegial meeting and everybody has a chance to say it and isn't drowned out by anybody, I guess it can be it can be good as long as it's applied evenly and nobody is singled out in terms of how it's enforced. Yeah. And Fred, I want to get you in and here on this, too. Um Will this be fairly enforced? I mean, because it, it seems like the people who make the controversial comments are the hard right people or people um, objecting to some uh, curtailing of civil liberties by the city council. I mean, so is there a prospect of this being evenly and fairly enforced in a way that makes people who aren't on the city council currently happy? Well, no, in all honesty. 
I mean, this is a stop me from expressing my opinion and my my concern about your act. The, the, the city council is not a courtroom where uh, you don't want to influence the jury by having comments of someone standing up um, and making comments back in the uh, back in the audience to to it, that may influence the jury one way or the other, and the judge wraps his gavel and has that person thrown out. You have the, the council and all public meetings without throughout the state have a period of time where folks can speak uh, for a period of time, three minutes, and it can be 90 minutes total for the public hearing at the beginning. And then each bill has, uh, that is uh, 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 up for a vote at a certain time has a public comment of a period available for that bill. It, it's just surprising that at a time in which we're going to have back-to-back African-American presidents of the city council, we get a, we get a, we get a, a, a some legislation that eventually, that essentially says, we don't want to hear it and we want you to stop. Now, clearly we've always had cops in the, in the, in the room to stop any unruly behavior, any uncivilized behavior. And if you're going over your time limit, the bell rings and you have to stop. But this business of, I don't want to hear anything, I don't want to see anything, I don't want any noise while we're doing it, is purely a measure to protect the sensitivity of the elected city council members who are supposed to be in tune with their constituents who are in that audience. I think it's a bad idea, but that's what we got. Again, we get the government we vote for, and for some reason, the city council members, at least 13 of them, feel threatened by these outbursts. Yeah, I mean, that 14 to 4 vote, I mean, that, that crossed party lines. So um, we don't have the breakdown of that vote, but that was pretty unanimous. Um, Tim, I want to get you in here sort of a devil's advocate thing. I mean, we, Jacksonville has been a city for a long time, dealt with a lot of controversial issues over the years. Um, you know, the school integration issue like 50 years ago was a really tough issue for the city to endure. Um, but it, it seems like in the last few years, you know, really since the end of the human rights ordinance expansion debate, we've seen the ratcheting up of these restrictions. The Scott Wilson presidency may have been when it really started, when when Scott Wilson got upset over uh, some outbursts in the crowd. Um, but it feels like we're on a slippery slope here. Um, you know, why now? Why Why can't the current council presidents the current council leadership run the city council in the way that it used to be before where you didn't need all of these rules. That's what surprised me about all of this. Having sat through interminable HRO um, council meetings and all of the debate that went on, all of the, um, you know, frankly, people who felt very passionate on both sides of that. And yet they were able to have city council meetings and go through it without having to put in these additional restrictions. I do wonder how much of this is a post-pandemic sort of thing, though. You, you, know, you talk to people who work in the service industry, and they'll complain about people, you know, forgetting how to be out at bars, forgetting how to act in a restaurant. That after a, a period of time where people couldn't be in council chambers, now they're back. You know, does does the council forget what it's like to deal with actual voters? Do do the people who are showing up to voice their opinions from how they should behave at a council meeting? I don't know if that comes into play as well. Yeah. And um, Claire, I want to get you in here. We got a second part of the story, too. The council rejected a bill to push back public comment to later in the schedule. Um, right now, public comment is pretty early in the in the agenda before a lot of things actually happen. So you get to hear the usual suspects for, for 90 minutes. Why didn't they want to push it back? Well, one odd thing about this bill is that the person who filed it, I believe it was Terrence Freeman, um, but the person who filed it had filed it as an emergency measure, which really didn't make sense for it to have been an emergency. And so, I mean, they rejected the bill and this this request to make it an emergency measure. But really, it seemed to be an, an effort to save time for the people that they're granting awards to or that are there for really short consent to agenda sort of business. But, you know, most of the council agreed that our schedule is set. People come for comment and we shouldn't be doing more business before public comment. As to the 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 one about how to behave in council meetings, I think the context of that bill is important. It wasn't written by Sam Newby himself. It was written by the legal department in reaction to a lawsuit against the city um, when Aaron Bowman was council president, a free speech lawsuit, someone who was kicked out and says it was unfair. So really this 
this new rule is about protecting the city's legal interests more than it is about protecting people's free speech rights. And it's, you know, a direct outcome of someone suing the city over over free speech violations as as they're claiming. So it's hard to imagine these rules being evenly enforced because it's such a wide range of of demonstrations. But I think it's important to to recognize that it really is for the purpose of protecting the city's legal interests. Yeah. Um, I want to give you a little bit of good news here. Um, it's Freedom Week. And you know what that means. You got tax savings. Um, consumers in Florida are going to have the chance for some relief by saving more than half a billion dollars by not having to pay sales tax on kayaks, diapers, energy and efficient appliances starting July 1st. Um, you know, these tax holidays have varying spans of time. Um, one lasts a week, another lasts two years. Um, Freedom Week runs through July 7th. That applies to fishing equipment, camping gear, pool supplies, other necessities for enjoying the outdoors. The first such tax holiday was approved last year. Um, Tim, I want to get you in here on this um, on these tax holidays. Um, do they really save people money? I mean, what what's the point of these tax holidays? Are they good for politics or good for people? I mean, we see estimated savings there. Um, you know, they, they add up, but are they really savings that people take advantage of reliably? They, uh, people do take advantage of them. Small retailers tend to like them um, because it can drive people into stores. The, the actual impact on the economy, though, is, is fairly mixed. The uh, economists who, who look at sales tax holidays generally say that they don't have any sort of long-term growth. It just it moves around when people are are buying things now obviously if you're getting a kayak for you know six hundred dollars and you don't have to pay sales tax on it that 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 saves you some money but um the 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 reason for the prolifer proliferation of these sales tax holidays is it's a great easy way for a politician to say look we're doing something without necessarily having you know any huge amount of, of impact um you know see making the strawberry shortcake the, the state dessert you know same sort of thing it, it makes somebody happy but the impact is, is muted yeah, um, and there's some others, too. We've got a year-long tax holiday for Energy Star appliances and for diapers and baby clothes. Um, this runs through June 30th of next year. Um, there's a two-year tax holiday and hurricane hardening for your home, impact-resistant windows, doors, and garage doors that run through June 30th, 2024. When you look at these appliance and hurricane hardening things, Claire, um, are these regressive tax breaks? I mean, they seem to benefit people who actually own things. But if you're renting, um, you don't really make out on this tax break, do you? Not necessarily. And it, it does seem like the state celebrates these tax breaks maybe more than people really benefit from them. I mean, you might save 10 or $15 this weekend. I mean, maybe the hurricane hardening for homeowners, but it's hard to imagine it materially improving people's lives to have a, a sales tax-free weekend. Yeah, and there's a couple more, too. There's three more here. I've got a so, slow scroll on my screen. Sorry. Um, a two-week back-to-school holiday from July 25th to August 7th. That'll be your school, your school stuff, like clothes, shoes, backpacks, etc. Um, a week-long sales tax holiday and equipment used by skilled trade workers, from gloves to power tools to safety glasses. And then you've got your fuel tax holiday. That's in October. That'll save you 25.3 cents per gallon. We'll see what 25 cents is worth um, in October. Um, it's not worth much right now. Uh, I think it's about time for us to go to our lightning round. Right on cue. Um, okay, uh, Fred Matthews, um, give me your lightning round. What are you doing this, labor, this Independence Weekend? I am going to enjoy the city. I'm going to get out and roll around a bit. But I've got <clears throat> I've got a bit of history. Florida, Jacksonville tied together real quick. The Tanji Brown Jackson takes her seat as Associate Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. She's from Florida, by the way. The two Florida senators voted against her. Val Demings, Congressman. She's from Jacksonville. She's running for the Senate. Uh, she was a representative of the Orlando area and is representative of Orlando area in or uh, uh, for this uh, past term. And interesting enough, she's a former police chief, also running as a former, uh, a former police chief from Jacksonville. Running for sheriff, of course, is Lakeisha Burton, who would be the first female to run. We just talked to her husband. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You just talked to her husband to run, and I, and uh, and and ironically, you've got the, uh, she's from Jacksonville, born and raised. 
And surprise, surprise, the next sheriff That's a lot of lightning. Of County will be an African American. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, Fred, for that. Um, Tim, tell us what's on your mind. What's your argument for Independence Day? Oh, uh, looking at what's happening in downtown Jacksonville. A lot, lot of activity of uh, buildings changing hands and uh, development plans that, uh, if it all comes to be, uh, could really be transformational. Right on. Uh, Dave, what are you doing for Independence Day? Or what are you looking at? Well, so among the laws that took effect today is uh, strawberry shortcake is now the official <laughs> dessert for Florida. So I will be eating some strawberry shortcake and putting down the key lime pie for this uh, 4th of July weekend. <laughs> Pictures or it didn't happen. Claire, what's up with you? You know, I don't really have plans for the weekend, but I will point out great reporting this week from my Jacksonville Today colleague, Will Brown, on how black workers are central to the maritime industry. Check that out at jackstoday.org. Check out the whole Jacks Today. And that's not all you need to check out. We've also got a medical show this weekend, Doctors as Physician Citizens. This means that medical professionals extend their sphere of influence from daily practice into the public arena. This is not for power's sake, but for the sake of community health. Tune in Saturday at 4 p.m. Thank you so much to our roundtable participants, uh, Fred Matthews and Tim Gibbons, remote, in studio, Dave Bearline, Claire Heddles. Thank you so much uh, for making a great roundtable. Have a great 4th of July.